So good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the second webinar of the Valitest webinar series on the use and validation of high throughput sequencing tests for diagnostic of plant pests. So for the one joining us uh, for the first time, uh, Valitest is an EU-funded project undertaken by a consortium of 16 partners and built to improve the reliability of diagnostic tests performed in plant health laboratories across the European and Mediterranean region. And you can find more information on the project on our web website. So this series uh, is about high throughput sequencing and the objective of the series is to present the recommendation developed by Valitest WP2 on the process of selection, development, validation and verification of high throughput sequencing tests and the quality assurance of their UTIN use as diagnostic tests. So these recommendations are general to enable a broad application in all plant health fields with appropriate flexibility to account for the changes of technologies. So after the introductory webinar on HTS uh, that was on Friday, today's webinar will focus on how to prepare your laboratory to conduct HTS tests and we'll cover general requirements such as facilities, personnel, quality management and so on, but also some special technical requirements to consider during the laboratory work and bioinformatic analysis. So the presentation, the webinar will be recorded and the link to the recording and to the PDF presentation will be provided on the Valitest website. And also uh, note that some polls will be asked, not in the GoToWebinar platform, but in WoodClap. And you will need either your mobile phone or a web navigator to answer. So today, our speaker is again uh, Sébastien Massard. So Sébastien is working at Jean Blue Agro Biotech, which belongs to the University of Liège in Belgium. He is a plant pathologist interested in diagnostic improvement, uh, plant virology and plant microbiome research. He is currently leading a research team of 10 scientists in plant pathology and he is also a professor at the University of Liège. So um, now we will uh, start the webinar. So um, Sebastian, I will uh, give you the floor and uh, enjoy the session. Okay, thank you very much, Charlotte, for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, uh, if you are not in the same uh, time frame as us. And I just take the last pointer, here we get, okay. Good, so today, today uh, it's a shorter session, but linked to how can I prepare the laboratory for using high throughput sequencing, about general and technical requirements. Uh, this is the first part of the guidelines. I will explain more in details the world guidelines uh, for the next session tomorrow. But have in mind that this is a common work of more than 50 uh, plant pathologists from many different areas. Virologists, bacteriologists, mycologists, even uh, entomologists. So the aims of these guidelines were to be as broad as possible and not pest or technology dependent. So preparing the laboratory. What we had in mind at the beginning of writing the guidelines, it was somehow targeting the diagnostic lab because progressively there is really an interest in applying high throughput sequencing in diagnostic quarantine, for example, post quarantine or certification. But on the other hand, what we think about uh, throughout writing this guideline, this collective effort, is that in fact part or a small, large part of the guidelines can be applicable to any research lab in order to raise the reliability of the results to use the proper controls to validate the results generated. So in fact, these guidelines are addressing are addressed no, not only to diagnostic lab, but to diagnostic lab and research lab. So in introduction, um, I just mentioned here two publications that we made several, well, three years ago with many other researchers on the potential of high throughput sequencing for the diagnostic of plant tests. In a few words here, uh, it's a scheme that has been drafted in the publication in the EPPO built here, 
what you can see here on the plants is the different techniques that you may wear serological microscopy culture molecular methods even greenhouse indexing all of these methods are able to detect either viruses bacteria fungi depending on what on the, the scope of the technique it's possible or not they can take from day to years and in fact, we can compare this panel of techniques, that's what we have done in the publication, with the high throughput sequencing, which means we will not look for an, uh, an antigene from the pest. We will not look for a bacterial cell, will not culture them, uh, will not grow in greenhouse, but rather we will extract the DNA and the RNA and sequence it. And from bites, we'll transform it into nucleic acids and identified the, 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 the pest and other microbes, uh, other organisms that are present in the sample. So there is like this possibility of high throughput sequencing as a broad scale without a priori diagnostic tool. That's okay for research and we are using it quite a lot, but how can I transfer a super fancy research tool into a very reliable diagnostic tool? making diagnostic as higher constraint of reliability. And that's what we have worked on on these guidelines. Remember, high throughput sequencing process, there are different steps from the sampling here, the laboratory part, the bioinformatic part, and finally, the confirmation, interpretation, and reporting. We uh, reviewed this different part on Friday, uh, so we won't get uh, again into it, but keep in mind that there are these different parts that needs to be taken into account once we want to raise the reliability of high throughput sequencing. So today we will focus on the requirements. And this requirement, as you can see here, is like general. The basic structure, like the foundation of a house, if you want to build, to make a, a comparison with a house, you have general requirement, foundation, what what do we need? And what we will go progressively into it is also the technical requirement, the content of the house. Uh, we, will well, um, we will overview them today and we will go more in details tomorrow. So today we, uh, we will, I will focus on general and technical requirements to prepare the laboratory for the use of high throughput sequencing to detect plant pests. First, let's have a look, and again, those who were present on Friday, you know how it works. Just scan this QR code with your, um, your smartphone or just write this on your browser. You will land on a WooClap application. You will land here for the moment. I don't start it yet. I wait that you can connect. So just scan, you can scan this QR code. You can um, use WooClap here to land on the page. You will arrive on the last question of Friday. I just let you uh, arriving and now once you are arrived, we can go for the question and the, the, what will be important for you. For you, what do you have in mind as general and technical requirements that can be important for you once you want to implement high throughput sequencing in the laboratory? You can think about your former experience with molecular methods, your experience with high throughput sequencing in research, or your experience with high throughput sequencing in, um, in routine diagnostic. I will make appear a, a, a cloud of words. So as previously, you can make suggestion. It's fully anonymous, so you can put whatever, well, you can put, don't, don't be ashamed to put something. You can put what you think about, what do we need? Uh, we have already determined we need accuracy, specificity, QA in place, and so on. And what we can have also, you can have a result list and you can like them. I, well, you can go onto all the list and say, yeah, QA in place, I agree with it. And you, you make uh, love on it. So here are the words, it uh, can be applied. What are for you, what is required? What do you need? for high throughput sequencing, to apply re reliably high throughput sequencing. And you see here all the terms are appearing. You can see some like reproducibility or computational requirements are liked, control to. The bioinformatic pipeline also is the most liked uh, element.
I'll let you think about, uh, make suggestion because it, it is it is interesting because we will see how we have addressed it or not. Maybe uh, what you think is important. I will let it as it is like that. It is more stable. You still have one minute to to think about to agree to validate some words because it's in, it's also interesting to see if uh, most of you agree or not with a specific. Uh, recommendation. If you are not yet com connected, you have always the words here. Uh, you can type this on your web browser and you will land on the page and you will be able to make uh, the survey and ask and, and propose or like what is uh, proposed. We still have 40 seconds uh, left. It's nice. Try, try to think to order it in your mind. Um, what seems the most important for you. Uh, it will also help you to navigate after through uh, the guidelines today and tomorrow. Okay, so the vote has have ended. I don't know why. Uh, okay, so if I look here, what is the uh, most striking observation? Uh, you, you mentioned the expertise, and indeed, it's the well, it's what is in uh, highest letter, so the most popular term. And indeed, uh, one part of the guideline are addressing the expertise of the staff, and you will see that it's on, not only laboratory, it's not only scientists, but there are also other expertise needed. You also uh, quite put in evidence this, the bioinformatic pipeline, and you see, here you have also bioinformatic and so on. This is particularly important, and that's a big change compared to what's, what are the current classical methodologies. We, don't, we did not need a big computing power. No, we will need it. And the guidelines are addressing it, uh, taking into account the different options. Uh, do I make everything internally or do I, work uh, with outsourcing part or a large part of the process. Uh, we have we are about equipment. I see here equip, uh, equipment here and there was another place with equipment. It's also important uh, and we will discuss tomorrow, for example, what do we do with the sequencer? Uh, should I buy it or should I outsource the uh, sequencing, for example? And you discuss also, you explain about the, these elements that are important, reproducibility, accuracy and specificity, uh, the controls, that's also very important elements that are included in the, in, the, in the guidelines. And finally, you also explain one here, I, I retain it uh, on no contamination. We will, expel, we will explain you that for contamination, we will have to switch off a little bit our way of thinking and our way to consider contamination. It appears at several places here, here, and here. Okay, good. That's a good overview of what's important. And you review uh, somehow nearly uh, all the aspects of the guidelines. Okay, so we will go on this today for the general requirement and tomorrow for more precise uh, information. So let's focus first on the frame of the house, this foundation, what it means, the general requirements. For the infrastructure, first element, um, again, think about the infrastructure in terms of laboratory, but also in terms of informatics. And what we recommend is to have access to appropriate facilities and information technology to perform the test. For example, you need a one-way process in the lab, PCR-like. Um, what is important also, if you look, you have to organize your laboratory as here it is an example from the literature with the pre-PCR with slight positive air pressure, the post-PCR with slight negative air pressure to avoid the amplicon going out of it. This is for a PCR, but if you go into details for uh, high throughput sequencing, uh, in some protocol, you have several PCR to be carried out, PCR1 and after PCR2. So how could you manage it? You have to think about that it's the general principle of PCR are present, but you may have to uh, have additional constraint. 
And for example, uh, if once you had the, the tag, the individual tag is like a second PCR on a first PCR once you do amplicon sequencing. So think about, yes, how could I organize it to avoid going back and forward from the pre and post area? And also another element that I put in between brackets, the, sequen the sequence sequencing machine. Should I integrate it in the lab or not? Um, she, she, the, the sequencing machine must be in post PCR, uh, for example, but uh, sh or should I use it in a specific place outside the lab to avoid contamination with DNA from plants or from other, um, other um, pests? So anyway, if you look the EPPO standard, and I go back to here, uh, 798, you have already quite detailed recommendation for molecular biology. What needs to be told is that maybe I should apply this recommendation a bit differently because, for example, my library preparation process include two PCR or include more steps than only a PCR. So that's a, a, a classical way, but here for that, the good news that you have already a standard available that covers pretty well uh, what would be needed. The other key aspects, it is the information technology. And you mentioned it as a very important point because indeed it's a new aspect. And I put it, it's the gigabyte era. You will not handle some megabase of real-time PCR results. It's gigabase or terabase, uh, terabytes, uh, sorry, of data. Um, <clears throat> so there, uh, a question that arises and that is a bit new for us, uh, it's what are the key elements that we have to take into account once we have to build the IT infrastructure. We'll go again on the WOOC lab to uh, also for you, what, uh, in your opinion, what are the key elements to have in mind once we do informatic? I will, if you're on the WOOC lab, just where you are here, I open a new room here. So if you want to join it, this is this. Key element, with your knowledge, your current knowledge, what should be taken into account when designing the information technology infrastructure for the high throughput sequencing? It can be software, it can be hardware, whatever you want. So let's think about it. I will uh, make this, uh, this way of results as a grid. Hey, here it is. So you can see uh, what are the different options Look on this, like them if you if you if you want. What should I think? Um, your mission is to implement high throughput sequencing in your laboratory. What do you have to think about for the information technology infrastructure? What should be taken into account? What is important? There's already very good ideas there. Again, again, I think we will cover uh, the different important points that are in the guidelines. It's pretty, pretty nice. We still have one minute to propose things to like uh, what you see. I will look at this with the cloud. And once you made, you mentioned, for example, storage capacity. What should be, what could define your storage capacity? How would you know that you need one terabytes, 10 terabytes, 1000 terabytes, or 100 gigabase? Okay, it is coming to an end. And so, what are, what is what's a bit your common ideas or your common vision on that? What seems to be the most popular one is the this two, uh, well, 
storage space and computing power. And that's it in two different but important elements. You need a certain server to store your data. And after, you need also another server to compute, to make the calculation. And the characteristics of the server can be very different. Uh, it's not the same as a repository server, then a computing power. It can be the same, but you have to think about this is two different operations. And <clears throat> important based on that, uh, you will have to transfer big quantities of data. So you have also to think about how can I easily transfer from the sequencer or the sequencing facilities where I have outsourced to my storage and from my storage to my calculation computer. If it is the same, it's not a problem. But this is things that you, you have to think about and we are, as a biologist, we don't use to. So this is indeed two very important elements here. Here, you, there is an interesting mention here, do not lose data. And indeed, you, we have to think about uh, the backup safety storage of the data. Uh, I will have my data here in my lab, but also have a backup in the cloud somewhere uh, with high redundancy to minimize the risk of losing data, which can be a, a problem. There is data security here. Oh, sorry, here. And indeed, it's very important. Uh, your, if you are, for example, uh, an official laboratory, you must keep your data confidential. So how can I manage to get the data safely stored and data that are not high, uh, hijacked or um, uh, by uh, informatic pirates? Uh, we, we see again is here as backup capacity, capacity, the possibility to go on cloud, which is indeed uh, in, in important. A good connection is indeed uh, required. And I saw also uh, a word about uh, package and well server good software here you see here good software indeed it's also it's about the infrastructure but also the algorithm that you will work on the server uh, it's not the not only having a super uh, computer to store and making the analysis is to implement on it the appropriate software that is adapted to your laboratory some laboratories will like linux based system other will need a Windows-based system. Both exist currently. That's a, that's a nice point. But okay, you, you, you address a lot of interesting elements here. And in fact, if you want to structure it a little bit, uh, I have it here. <clears throat> all this part here and all the, these parts here is related to your storage capacity, in fact. Because you will have to have an idea about the, the quantity of data that you get. And so that means the number of samples you might proceed per year, per month, or every two years, if you need to conserve data two years, or if you need to conserve the data five years, number of samples during five years. What are the data generated per sample? Do you generate also intermediate data and final data? It can multiply your original quantity of data. How much time do you need to conserve it and to backup? So purely in terms of infrastructure, all these elements are important to design the capacity, either the capacity of storage, but here the data per sample, uh, it's also the computing capacity. It's not the same analyzing 10 million sequence versus 1 billion sequence, for example. And here you have this kind of safety, privacy, what are important, uh, local or cloud, based and the ability to transfer data. And in fact, as you mentioned very well, importance of storage hard drive and of the computing power, I put CPU and one of the participants made a good uh, suggestion of GPU that are also no use and sometimes very uh, efficient for analyzing data sets. So that's for the information technology. For the personal, uh, it was also mentioned in the first uh, cloud of words, you need trained people and it's for scientists and technician and as any other uh, diagnostic laboratory it has to be proven to be competent for what it is needed but here <clears throat> you can design four profiles in fact it's for laboratory like operator technician for the data management and the, here it's more an information technology you need to have the support of the IT department of your organization it's needed also for the analysis of data 
uh, it's called do you need a bioinformatic itself or your scientist is able to do uh, the bioinformatic analysis through Linux or Windows based um, uh, pipeline and lastly which is still remain very important it's the interpretation of the results so in fact you need different profile and here informatic and bioinformatic are somehow new profile compared to what's uh, existing before and for the scientist we will ask him more him or her more uh, to do for interpret smartly the result which is not always so easy third point so infrastructure personnel the quality management system and you mentioned it also in the cloud we need to have a quality assurance system in place and indeed uh, the quality management should be in place to ensure operation the consistent operation in performing HTS tests, having clearly detailed SOP, SOP, standard operating protocol, and also traceability throughout the process. Uh, it's more more complex process than a RT-PCR or microscopic observation. So you need to trace all this process and all the steps. So it might it might be a bit more complex, and you may you have to trace and to ensure consistent operation for informatic also, not only for the lab. And in fact, if you look, it's mandatory anyway uh, for the official laboratories that needs to be uh, ISO 17025 accredited uh, in uh, European Union, for example. So there are some um, explanation in the guidelines related to this uh, quality, the, 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 the importance of having a quality management system. Very important point that is quite new, it's the outsourcing. We don't, as diagnostic lab or even as scientists, we don't use to outsource a lot, even if things are changing. But here I made two examples on the contradiction that you may have. And I took two machines from Illumina, so the Illumina technology. If you want to use a Nova SX 6000, it's 1 million to buy it. But after, and it's really estimation there, it can vary, you're around 3 euro per million reads. So clearly, this is completely unaffordable for diagnostic laboratory. It's only for big sequencing facilities that can afford that. On the other hand, MySeq, which became more uh, affordable, it's still more than 1,100 euro or dollar. So it's already a big price. And if you look on the, the price per million of reads, you are nearly 30 times higher. So if you look for the use of today, to, of every day, you would like to have it, this Novasec. But if you have to buy it, uh, clearly you go to, to MySeq. So there is an economical optimal, depending, and that's why it's important to think about the number of sample and number of data I will need for my sample to find if it's, what is the economical optimal? I use a MySeq that I can use internally, or I address to an external sequencing facility for using, for, for example, this Nova SX 6000. So this outsourcing, you have to think um, three important elements, the machine cost, the cost of use, but also the timing. I mean, for my research, I use the Nova SX 6000 outsourced in the sequencing facility of my university. I have a very nice price uh, per, per base, but I know sometimes I have to wait for six, eight weeks to get the results. So is it acceptable in terms of diagnostic? Most probably not, or not in every case. Maybe, maybe sometimes yet, but most often, no, you need the result quite quickly. So it's a delicate equilibrium that you have to think from the beginning. And that's why it's also important to think about the quantity of data, the number of samples to be uh, analyzed. Another element that is uh, outsourced by many laboratories, but not all, is the library preparation, remember transforming the DNA from the nucleic acid into a sequencing ready format. What is existing, and I, I made some trials when I was working for a company, we saw that a technician that handle a library preparation routinely performed much better than uh, the, the backup technician that use it more rarely. And it's linked with the experience curve, the classical experience curve and the theory of experience curves that the, the, the cost per unit, the time spent by the technician is decreasing with the number of libraries that you, that you have. It is doing more and more efficient. And what is important in our case, I really 
transform this experience curve into reliability performance depending on the number of libraries. And we, have, we are in such growing phase, maybe like steeper or not, whatever. But the more you do library prep, the better you will do it. So that's also something you have to think about. Do I internalize this part or not? Or do I internalize it partly or not? Anyway, for outsourcing, what we recommend in the guidelines is that you should check the quality performance. And for example, you can do either an audit if it's near your neighbor, or you can look for provider that have accredited ISO 17 or 25. And there are many providers that are accredited ISO 17 or 25 to provide sequencing data. So you keep your whole process under accreditation and you can maintain an accreditation for the HDS. Let's next point is managing modifications. And indeed it's pretty important because if once you have, uh, for example, an ELISA test available, this ELISA will not be modified over the years, very rarely. I mean, the, the, the test is working from years or even decades. On high throughput sequencing, you have still very regularly upgrade of the machine, of upgrade of the library preparation kit. And what you have still more often, it's the upgrade of bioinformatic protocols. A new software is doing the things quicker um, with more accuracy or more specificity and so on. So from the beginning, you have to think, how can I monitor, implement, and document the modification that I will apply in the laboratory? the reagent, the versioning of the kits, uh, the sequencing machine, and so on, and also the bioinformatic. In addition, for data management, and that's a bit what we, we, we do. Oh, sorry, my PowerPoint crashed. Uh, let's go. Uh, Here it is. So, just okay. Okay, so here, oh, um, the data management is pretty important uh, for the data itself, but here I wanted to underline also something which is in the guidelines. This is the reference data sets. You, we ex I explained Friday that we compare our result, the sequence that we have generated, with databases. So, these databases need to be. Uh, carefully store it, maintain it, and validate the integrity. And one very important element that you will have to struggle with and to balance is the completeness versus the curation or the accuracy. If you want to take the most complete database, it's GeneBank. You have nearly the, all the sequence that have been generated and published, at least. This is the most complete database. Very important positive point. You will not miss something. But this in CBI, on the other hand, for this global database, I, I'm talking about the NT database, for example. This database is also full of errors. I mean, full, no, but there are errors in it. And so if you compare your results with, or your, your sequence is close to a sequence that is in fact an error in the metadata, it will, it will give you a wrong results, in fact. So there is always this equilibrium between the completeness, having the most information available, versus the accuracy, the curation of the database. And that's something which needs to be balanced. Uh, if you are doing uh, bacterial or fungal communities, you have plenty of very good uh, database. Let's think about Silva, Green Gene, and so on. Which ones need to be used? Which one is curated or not? Uh, how often they are updated, so you can have the, uh, the most recent version. But take care if you update it, uh, you have to validate that you don't uh, introduce bias comparing to your previous results. So it's actually all, not only the data as we have both in the cloud in the cloud that we have done, but also the data from the reference that needs to be evaluated and also to think how can I. Or should I upgrade it progressively or not? Okay, so that was uh, for the really the, the foundation, the, um, the extent of the OS. Now let's go on more technical requirements 
which is the content of the house and first the laboratory. Laboratory, what is very important, you have to define the scope of your test. Basically, on which matrix and targets I will work. I use HTS for certification of grapevine. I use HTS for post-entry quarantine of any plants. I use HTS for certification of potato, whatever. You need to define it clearly because it will influence all the rest, the extent of validation, the controls, and so on. So it's a, it seems a simple step, but you need to think it very well because it's like the beginning. And from that, everything will, uh, will, will, will come from that, in fact. So for the laboratory component, uh, and remember, we go from sampling to sequencing. And in fact, you should select each step. What, is the, what, are, what would be my sampling protocol? What would be my nucleic acid extraction protocol? What would be my library preparation protocol? And so on. You have to develop it if needed, or if you have a validated one, you just have to verify it and optimize for the intended use that is describing the scope. And once you have validated, uh, the story has not ended with the laser, uh, because in fact, you should monitor the performance throughout time during routine, routine use. And that's, I won't say easy, but that's something which is doable, not so with not so, so much difficulties. We explain uh, more details in the, in the guidelines, how to monitor over time. We have, you generate data every month or every week, how to monitor them. Um, the sampling, so the sampling protocol, we recommend that, that it should be appropriate to matrix and pest targeted. But actually, that's what I told uh, Friday. You need something which is uh, appropriated and, if possible, of the highest quality, and at least a quality which is compatible with the targets that you have defined in the scope. The sample handling, that's the same. You should insert sample integrity and suitability for the HTS test, how should I store my samples, store my nucleic acids, store my library before sequencing? And uh, the nucleic acid, it's, I mean, nucleic acid extraction protocol, it's like I told Friday, you know very well your plants, your microbes, your, your, your insect, use the, the, the recommended or the most used or your preferred uh, uh, nucleic action extraction uh, protocol. So for the library prep, uh, again here it's like formal recommendation. The library preparation protocol should be suitable for the sequencing platform. We we'll review Friday how to make or what are the library preparation for Illumina uh, with Amplicon on one side and <clears throat> on shotgun on the other side. And as I told Friday, this must be compatible. The library for Lumina will never work with another system. <clears throat> one, one point that is also very important is the pooling of libraries. Because remember, in this flow cell here that I show Friday and I show it again today, uh, this flow cell, you have six, five, eight or sometimes one lane. And in this lane, you, you will put several samples together. And the pooling, uh, even if you try to normalize as much as possible your sample to make an equimolar mix, you will always have variation of sequencing depth between your sample, depending on the sample, depending sometimes on the tag used. So anyway, this level of pooling, you should be, think about it, based on the intended use of the HTS test and the performance, the analytical sensitivity. I know if I mix 50 samples together, I, I know that one sample will be, might be at very low or too low concentration in terms of, and after in terms of, of sequence generated. So I must ensure that for the sample that is less sequenced, I will still reach the minimal level, number of sequence uh, to be generated to achieve the the requested analytical sensitivity. So pooling of a library, you have to think about it. What would be my level of pooling? And for example, you can pool much more on Novasec 6000 compared to MySeq also, while generating much more data. So it's something you have, that you need to think about also, what is my level of pooling? Here it's an example, but we review it also Friday, that currently, uh, 
Illumina, for example, you have a dual indexing, one at one extremity, one indexed at one extremity, and one indexed at the other extremity. So you, we pull all together, and these two index allow further to sort the reads. For the sequencing, uh, the recommendation, you should, the sequencing platform and method should be appropriate for the intended use. Again, think about your scope, what you want to, on which matrix, which best, which level of analytical sensitivity, and use the sequencing platform adapted. We have an over, we had an overview on Friday on the different platform here, and it's up to you to really think about what is needed. And see, for example, you need the Illumina platform. What could be the best for you? MySec internally, MySec outsourcing, or NovaSec 6000 outsourcing, for example. There is plenty of other Illumina machine, but you have to think also about this sequencing itself. I put it here, but I won't go into details here, but we, we talked in the guidelines about what are the key elements to take into account to design and to evaluate the best sequencing option. Again, combination between platform cost, use of cost, and timing. And here are more detailed uh, elements. And that could be nice once, if you want to outsource, you will ask for tender. Uh, you can have things to think about. Uh, okay, I have to think, for example, is there some support, for example, from the company, or they just let you the raw data, uh, or do they support you if there is any trouble to try to troubleshoot uh, the difficulty? Um, and for example, the error rate, uh, you can also request a minimal or maximal error rate percentage, depending on your application. Remember, amplicon we need high quality, uh, shotgun for viruses, we might work with lower quality sequence. So, a uh, key element, uh, it's the, the contamination also on the laboratory component. Uh, the laboratory should prevent contaminations. And that's a big deal, contamination, because we are in PPM, par per million. If you generate 50 million sequence, it's usual to see contamination of five, 10, even 20 reads of a target of a pest. And I won't go into detail here, uh, which needs uh, some much more time, but think that we most probably, and I'm not certain, but I think it's, it's the way we go. We will go for a qualitative approach. Is it contamination or not? Yes, no, if there is contamination, I redo. To a quantitative approach, meaning, I will have contamination, very low level contamination, but does it impede or does it puzzle the interpretation of the results? So that's what I mean. We will go from a qualitative view, yes, no, to a quantitative view of contamination. Is it the level of contamination, is it low enough, in fact, to get the results? Um, the impact, for example, of the, lab, the, the contaminants, uh, there is one publication last year, uh, two years ago, in fact, they just calculate the number of contaminating bacterial or eukaryote sequence in the different kits. And you can see that whatever the kits, you always have, in fact, a background of sequence coming from the kits, not from the sample. So that's even internally, the kits can generate bacterial uh, sequences. Because why? Because, uh, for example, the polymerase are produced by bacteria. And so you still have, you can still have some bacterial DNA in uh, your sample. And this bacterial DNA, as tiny amount as it is, can be detected by sequencing. The other element that I was mentioning here, it's really the intersample contamination, cross contamination between samples. So that's for the laboratory part. Last part of the technical requirements are related to bioinformatics. And for, to give you an overview about the bioinformatic, I will just share with you a work that we have done in the, the frame of the cost action, uh, where, in fact, we ask ourselves, does bioinformatics matter? Is it important for high throughput sequencing? Uh, we had in mind that yes, but we wanted to make a large scale experiment to compare the performance of bioinformatics from different laboratories. So what we did, in fact, I created, in fact, 10 data sets. These data sets were coming from a potato that has a new NIPO virus unknown at the time of making the trials. An apple sample with a very low amount of 
apple stem grooving virus, 0 to 12 percent of the reads. And we had a grapevine sample with plenty of viruses, among which, for example, here a viroid at very low concentration, and a complex mix of Marafi viruses very closely related to each other and not well characterized in the database. So what has been done there? Uh, the files were prepared at uh, low sequencing depth, only 50,000 reads to 2.5 million reads, to put in worst case scenario. These 10 files were put available on a server in double blind. Here are the 10 files. And we asked to the 21 participants in to interpret the data in a diagnostic setting. Just analyze these data according to your pipeline and interpret them. What do we get? We get here the analytical sensitivity. And what we see that overall, we get an analytical sensitivity of 70%. You, we see that for individual laboratories, and you have here all the laboratories, the average ranged between 35% to 100%. Huge impact in analytical sensitivity of the bioinformatic pipeline and the interpretation of the scientist. But we have to, to, to keep in mind the false discovery rate was higher for the laboratory having performed very well. So it's like a balance. Again, very good analytical sensitivity, but higher false discovery um, uh, re rate. Then the sensitivity rises with the number of reads. You see, the more reads that we have, the better we detect the viruses, mostly the low abundance virus. This underlines the importance of fixing a, a minimal sequencing number to validate a sample. And for example, one third of the laboratory gets a 100 person at 2.5 million sequence. If you look the reproducibility also based on a, a grapevine replicate in which we put two uh, replicate at the same depth, we have 92 person of reproducibility, so quite reproducible, but if you were wrong, it was reproducible too. A 100 person of reproducibility for 15 strategies, and there was a correlation with analytical sensitivity. Uh, we classified the laboratories by analytical sensitivity, and we see also there is a trend in the reproducibility. So the response was yes, and if you want more information, there is this publication from two years where we, did, we have much more details on what's important there. It's applied on small RNA, but I do believe the big element, the big, uh, the key information are applicable, whatever, whatever the techniques and whatever your scope, even for amplicon sequencing. So it's really a key component. You can generate false negative, false positive results on bioinformatic. It usually consists of a combination of software to analyze the raw sequencing data. Remember the three steps of bioinformatic, you will not use a single software. And even if you use a one-click software, Inside of it, you have different algorithms that will make the calculation. It's still for, and I, it's like the trinity of bioinformatic, the reliable analysis, and I, I insist on that, will depend on the software you use, the database you use, remember what I told you before today, but also the parameters that you use and the threshold that you use. You can have the most appropriate software, the most updated database, you use wrong threshold, it puzzles your results. So all these three elements need to be taken into account in order to achieve a reliable analysis. The three steps, you know them, uh, we, I detailed it uh, Friday, but the key element, analysis of raw reads, what we should do is to make several different steps. And to go directly in what is important, it's this. We, we drafted a, a flow chart to help the researcher think about what should I do as analysis of the raw reads. And you can see here all the different steps that are proposed. You see demultiplexing, uh, removal of primer or adapter, eliminating duplicated reads, eliminating uh, background reads uh, or low quality uh, reads, uh, here, sorry, elimination of low quality reads and sequence. So this flow chart is like a guide to evaluate if in my process I have told about all these different elements and continue there with more options. So if you want to implement it, this flow chart will help you to structure it and to see, do I need to make all these steps or not? 
I mean, the, for example, the removal of redundant reads must not be done for amplicon sequencing, but it can be interesting for shotgun sequencing. So that in the guidelines, you have a flow chart that detailed everything. Remember this structure of the reads here, um, the trimming, when I mean primer adapter trimming, is trimming all, for amplicon sequencing, all these parts with artificial uh, nucleic acids for the sequencing, but also the reverse or forward primer that you need to trim at one moment. The quality trimming means here, if you have all the sequence that are of low quality, you eliminate them. The key element is that you could have misassignment during the multiplexing. There are errors in barcode, switching of index. So it may happen that a small background, and here you see it's small percentage, but applied on 1 million reads, it can be important, of mismatch or incorrect uh, barcode. You either, it's a barcode that you don't have put, you don't know from where it comes, or even a barcode from one sample that is, that is in fact on another sample, what is called index hopping. I will not go into detail again, but think, have in mind that this evaluation of barcode and quality, you have a trade-off between I remove misassigned barcode, the more I do, the less risk of, of uh, wrong assignation of barcode. So the stronger, the, the more stringent you are on barcode uh, assignation, the lowest background you will have. But on, on the other hand, you will eliminate a lot of sequence. So if you are more relaxed, you will be a lot of sequence, but among which you will have a background of misassigned mis sequences. That's something which is evolving. So uh, even I cannot say what would be the case, what would be the situation tomorrow, but have in mind that you have also this kind of uh, balance between these two elements. The second step of the bioinformatic is the identification of the targets. And I say targets, but because it's not only pests, you might identify targets, I mean bacteria, fungi that are not pests at all, but in fact, as the high throughput sequencing is without a priori, you may detect them. For this, again, we did the same as raw read. We, dry, we draft a flow chart explaining all the different steps that are possible and for which you have to think about to transform all the reads into a few taxonomical information on your targets, including the potential pest in your sample. Uh, and there is plenty of option depending on if you have done amplicon sequencing or shotgun sequencing. And this draft goes further uh, until what, is it, what it is in fact the third step of the bioinformatic analysis, which is the evalu evaluation of controls. And there are several important evaluation proposals that are uh, included in the guidelines. This analysis of control uh, it's about, well, do I get the expected targets in my controls or even in my sample? Uh, do I get false negative results from my control? And also the evaluation of background contamination, cross sample contamination or kit contamination in my data sets. So that's the third element, analysis of control that you find here in the, in the, the flow chart from the guidelines, but which is also uh, de de described in the guidelines. So after this general and technical requirement, let's go for the conclusion. In fact, hydroput sequencing clearly opened new possibilities, new opportunities to improve the diagnostic of plant pests, uh, even the official uh, diagnostic, uh, and from, from the official diagnostic to even the research and the study of the ecology of viruses or the epidemiology of viruses. It's not an easy change. Um, Think back, uh, the, the, the change from serology to molecular biology was, was somehow complicated uh, with more complex protocol to apply, a higher risk of contamination and so on. We may be in a similar phase. Uh, transition for classical molecular biology to high throughput sequencing uh, is not an easy, uh, easy change and needs to be really think in advance to be evaluated in depth. That's the goal of the guidelines, in fact. 
Um, there are general and technical requirements that are similar for high throughput sequencing than to molecular methods. I remember on the laboratory, the organization of the laboratory is important, but you have for all these elements some specificities for high throughput sequencing, and there is a big specificity, which is the bioinformatic and informatic component. This is something which is completely new and different, and which can, well, which deserve a specific attention. So here we are. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you also for your participation to the pools. Um, and if you have questions uh, um, related to what has been explained today, feel free to, to propose them in the chat. We could, uh, I will answer it as much as I can. So thank you, Sebastian. So um, we, uh, yes, so people, you can either ask question in the chat. You can also uh, raise your hand if you want, and uh, we can give you the floor. But just remember that this session is recorded. So if you take the floor, then uh, know that uh, your question will be recorded. So um, there is uh, one question: Will HTS still results still need to be confirmed by PCR or Sanger sequencing? So there, uh, you have to consider HTS like uh, one more technology in the panel of technologies available to detect pest. And so there, we will have to follow somehow what is the legal requirements. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but a quarantine pathogens, you detect a quarantine pest, whatever it is, you need often to confirm the detection by an independent technique. So in that case, you need to, con to, to have two different tests confirming the presence. And so there, uh, it will not be different than high throughput for high throughput sequencing compared to PCR, compared to ELISA or serological testing. We, the, the key element is that it's another tool to improve. It's not a, a tool that would radically change completely the way we proceed for official diagnostic. And so most probably where a single technique is enough in specific cases, we will keep on the high throughput sequencing. If a confirmation is needed, we will continue with a confirmation after the high throughput sequencing. And in fact, just to give you a, an example, uh, which is not diagnostic, but which give an idea, in publication, scientific publication, once you discover, for example, a new virus, uh, it is requested in the huge majority of the case, sometimes it is forgotten, but it is requested that you confirm what you have detected by, uh, for example, a PCR, usually it's by RPCR or RT-PCR. Ideally, with generic primer, if, for example, you identify a new virus there, you you will ideally you, are, you confirm this detection by using, for example, a um, universal primer for this genus of virus. Or if there is no universal primer, you use specific primer designed on the genome sequence. But you have to confirm somehow. And I think it will not be radically different. It's another tool. Uh, I don't say it cannot change the way the confirmation is done, but at this stage, it will be. Uh, it will need to be confirmed when a confirmation is needed. So, uh, in relation to this question, um, isn't HTS more sensitive than PCR? And how do you confirm something that that I cannot detect by PCR and that you can detect by HTS, especially when they are not highly concentrated? Yeah. So. so um, there, if you look at the literature, you have contrasting observation. In some cases, uh, the HTS is, we hope you observe that HTS is more sensitive than PCR. And you can detect, for example, uh, viruses, this is the case, you can detect viruses with HTS that are not detected by PCR. So that's, what, that's one point. And indeed, in that case, it will be complex to prove it, confirm it by PCR. Um, what you can think about if you are with a living organism and you target, you see that there is potentially this pest at very low level. You can see how can I, for example, enrich by bacterial culture or plating, whatever, 
this uh, specific organism. Uh, there, are, there are possibilities of using selective media, which orientate after and make you, for which you may confirm the PCR. But that means in terms of when I have an absence of confirmation, uh, you have to look back, well, do I get 100 sequence or do I get 10,000 sequence? Uh, the, the interpretation will not be the same. But anyway, if you are really with 100 sequence, very low level, and actually, the PCR is not so sensitive as HTS. It can be more complex. What, well, somehow enriching the the, the, vir the the virus or the bacteria might help to achieve the relevant sensitivity for PCR. On the other hand, you have to have to keep in mind that high throughput sequencing is not always as sensitive as RT-PCR. Uh, and for example, at the beginning uh, of this year, we just published in Phytopathology a comparison between uh, real-time PCR and amplicon sequencing to detect fungi and quarantine fungi into spore trap in mixed population of, of fungi. And what we have observed in this publication is, for example, that for some of the quarantine fungi, we detect actually the uh, fungi by real-time PCR, and on the same DNA, we do, did not detect it by high-throughput sequencing. So, I mean, the high-throughput sequencing will not always be of higher sensitivity. Sometimes it's a, it has lower sensitivity. And in our case, it might be problematic because it's about quarantine pathogen and, and traces, but somehow it's also put the ground for us to improve the sensitivity of high-throughput sequencing. Should I generate more sequence per sample uh, or to, to try to, to detect this fungi that was detected by real-time PCR and not high throughput sequencing? Okay, fine. But if I generate more sequence, I have one problem, is that I will also have more and more background contamination. So it's a balance. And uh, there, is a not, there is not a fit for whole uh, response for that. Yeah, and there is um, someone in the chat that is commenting that uh, from her experience, uh, the qPCR is more sensitive than HTS. So usually if they got a CT value higher than 24 using the qPCR, then um, they do not detect it with HTS. So it kind of goes with what you were saying. Yeah. So it, it, another question we have is how do you implement the quality assurance of the bioinformatic component of the HTS? That's a, uh, that's a very key question and that can be quite complex and even it's complicated for the auditor to evaluate this. Uh, so just to share my first experience on that, it was again uh, nearly a decade ago. We go for the, in a company, we go for the accreditation of high throughput sequencing. But what we decide is that we stopped at the generation of raw data because there was absolutely no guidelines, no information on the bioinformatic, what to do with the bioinformatic. And it was in human health, so nothing to do, well, it, it was at the forefront at that stage. But now progressively, you have more and more recommendation or more practical example. And there, uh, I mean, it's, it's a job that you have to do with informatician. Because in fact, the IT department of your organization used, at least in terms of data management, used to have backup, to have security level uh, encryption of the data or protection of the data, uh, the use of managing the transfer of data and so on. So for the data management, the IT department could help you. On the other hand, there is the software and the analysis itself. And there, I mean, once you have stuck somehow your version, your threshold, you have just to ensure that it's not easily modificable. You have another people working on that and by, by well, without willing to do it, just change one of the threshold, which will modify the interpretation. So there it's about how to fix the pipeline to be sure that everything is used on the same way always. And you can see uh, in the available pipeline, for example, you have embedded pipelines that, that, that can do everything uh, in just one row. There are plenty of one for viruses, for bacteria, for fungi. Uh, and there you can somehow freeze or impede 
the, uh, pa the parameter modification. What can be very useful there, I, I didn't explain it today, but I, I have a word on, uh, I will have a word on this tomorrow, most probably, is the uh, availability of data sets. I mean, if with your sample, you always process the same FASTQ file from a reference sample, from a control sample, I mean, not sequenced, it's just a FASTQ file on your server, you take it and you analyze it with all your sample, you can validate that you get exactly the same results as before. And the point is that once you want to change, for example, in uh, an update of the software, there we will go to the session of tomorrow, in fact, where we discuss about when to verify, when to validate um, the pipeline once there is small changes in all the process. So data management, see with your IT people, they used to do it. And for the software itself, it, you have to find a way to fix and to have a, a pipeline that cannot be modified easily or, or, or which could not be modified by the people using it if you have several people uh, using the pipeline. So we have other question. I will just put a last one because the, the two others are more related to what will be discussed tomorrow. So uh, for you, what are the elements you believe are the most important to take into account to ensure reproducibility of the outcome? Uh, clearly the laboratory. Uh, the variation that you can create in your laboratory will be higher than the bioinformatic. The bioinformatic is essential during the validation. Uh, there, the, val the way you validate your pipeline after you fix it. And so you will not introduce, mon I mean, uh, reproducibility trouble. You see the people get a very nice reproducibility in the, the result I very quickly presented when uh, 21 uh, laboratories tested the same data set. So bioinformatic, once you st the key element is to set it up at the beginning. On the other hand, the laboratory, um, there, the point is that as, as in the laboratory any step can introduce potentially a bias up to the sequencing machine and um, there is in fact I well it's a it's about the session of tomorrow also because there it's about the risk and tomorrow I will detail a little bit all the risks that are present and all the risks well, that need to be taken into account and you will see that in the guidelines we have listed 29 risks of um, problem of sensitivity, of uh, reproducibility, whatever, or bias, whatever the bias, in fact. And we have a list of these 29 risks for which we have identified, explained the potential origin, the impact, and mitigation measure. So for me, the risk in routine is more linked to the laboratory, provided you have fixed it well your bioinformatic and with safety backup, uh, security, and so on. Uh, but each of the steps can have several risks, and we will explain it tomorrow. Yeah, and so there are two questions. Uh, how do you determine what is an artifact, and what control do you recommend? And this will also be covered uh, yeah, 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 in tomorrow's yeah. Uh, webinar. Yeah, yeah. And, but, um, yeah. and there, yeah, well, I would need several more webinar to explain a little bit where, where things are advancing. But yes, the, the determining the difference between an artifact and an actual detection uh, might be done partly by bioinformatic workflow. We are developing, for example, here a bioinformatic workflow to sort out um, the sure detection and the sure contamination. But anyway, we still remain with a gray zone in between. And that's why I mentioned today that the scientists will, will be very important in the biological interpretation and we can require more from the scientists uh, because the expertise of the scientists will be key in order to decide, well, this one, is it actually an artifact or a low level infection? Or is, do we have a sample cross? And so, based on that to decide what i need to confirm or not is also important well will also be on the scientific expertise so even if you think i put sequencing it's like very automated process by informatic analysis is going on you will need more than ever the expertise of a scientist to 
interpret the data, and that's part of the guidelines, the chapter seven on the data interpretation. Okay, so we have passed the time and people uh, start to leave the webinar. So I would like to uh, thank you, Sebastian, uh, for the nice webinar again today and thank all of the attendees for participating. There it will be a satisfactory survey at the end of the webinar and in the follow-up email, it's really short. Do not hesitate to provide feedback. And uh, yeah, the presentation and the link to the recording will be available on the website. And uh, yes, our next webinar, which is uh, tomorrow, uh, will be on how to develop, validate, and routinely use uh, HTS test for diagnostic purpose. Uh, Sebastian, you wanted to add something? No, just a teaser. Yeah. There will be more concrete elements like the, this risk analysis, the point of validation, verification. So oh, today it was like building the house and its content. Tomorrow we'll go a bit more in detail. So uh, welcome also for tomorrow. Yeah, so we have to see you tomorrow and have a nice end of the day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.